Hello class, so today we're going to cover the cell cycle. In today's lecture, the two parts will basically cover, in part A, we're going to sort of look at um, some of the phases of the cell cycle and how it's sort of regulated globally. And then in part B, we're going to be looking at um, some of the actual uh, sort of structural things that happen during the cell cycle and how that's regulated. Okay, so hopefully the, the cell cycle needs no introduction. I'm sure you guys have had this in, in a lot of your um, different biology uh, courses. Um, and ultimately, cells need to sort of control their own growth and development. And that uh, process is actually called cell cycle control. Um, and it turns out that this is a really important topic in, in uh, sort of medicine because loss of cell cycle control is really a hallmark of cancer. Um, and so understanding this process uh, has been just a, a of, of huge interest to the scientific community. And in fact, there's a couple of chemotherapeutic drugs that have been in use for decades um, that basically target the cell cycle and stop it from working. Um, and so what I hope for you guys to learn out of these lectures is to learn about all the phases and the subphases and how they're controlled, okay? And then what control they elicit to um, certain aspects of the cell cycle. Okay, so if we look at the cell cycle in its sort of most basic form, what you have is basically a cell, um, and then you have growth um, and chromosome replication, right? It's got to replicate its genome. And then once it's replicated its genome, it can segregate uh, all of the chromosomes, and then it can divide um, into two daughter cells, okay? So quite simple. Um, and it's broken down sort of into two um, phases. There's the S phase, which is when the synthesis uh, is happening so that all the DNA re is being replicated. And then there's M phase, and that's when the cell undergoes mitosis and actually divides. And the last step in M phase is, is cytokinesis, where the cells actually divide, pinch off from one another, um, and become two separate cells. Um, but those phases are actually um, sort of interspersed with what are called gap phases, or G1 and G2. And so technically, the cell cycle um, exists in four phases, okay? There's mitosis, nuclear division, and then cytoplasmic division, or cytokinesis. There's G1, which is a gap phase, um, and then there's S phase, where it's replicating all of its uh, um, DNA, or the synthesis phase. Um, and then there's another gap phase before it enters mitosis. Okay, and I'm sure you guys have all um, seen this before. But specifically in M phase, um, there's a lot of sort of sub phases. Okay, so during G1, G2, and S phase, uh, that's sort of called interphase. And then when the cell is actually dividing, um, it's called M phase. Okay, and M phase is broken down into a number of different sub phases. Okay, there's prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase telophase, um, and then cytokinesis, okay? Now, important point um, in all of this is the metaphase to anaphase transition, and there's actually a checkpoint here to make sure everything is, is good to go for division, okay? Um, your book in panel, uh, at least in version or edition six of your book in panel 17, really goes over well what happens um, in these different subphases, and I encourage you guys to um, read it. But just in a summary, um, you have the centrosomes that actually get uh, moved to opposite poles um, of the cell in prophase, and the DNA starts to condense. Okay, so I really want you guys to know what's happening in all of these different subphases, so make sure um, you sort of uh, learn them. In prometaphase, um, what you have is basically breakdown of the nuclear envelope, fully condensed chromosomes, and then you start to get um, capture of the chromosomes um, by the mitotic spindles that are present, okay? Um, and then during metaphase, you have bipolar attachment to the chromosomes, and they actually get lined um, sort of aligned in the center of the cell, okay? And that's called the metaphase plate, okay? Or at least that's what it used to be called. Um, and then once all of the chromosomes are lined up in metaphase, um, 
uh, there's a checkpoint, and if that checkpoint um, is okay and all of the chromosomes have bipolar attachment uh, on the sort of um, the metaphase plate there, then you can actually enter anaphase. And anaphase is when you start to segregate all of the chromosomes. Okay, so the chromosomes are, which are attached to one another um, in, or the sister chromatids which are attached to one another uh, in um, M phase actually get separated and then they get pulled apart. Okay, and then in telophase, uh, you actually have some interpolar microtubules that sort of push the uh, cells apart. The DNA starts to um, decondense, um, and then all of a sudden the nuclear envelope starts to reform. Okay, and then all to, and you start to get the beginnings of what's called uh, the contractile ring. Okay, and then finally in cytokinesis, the contractile ring creates a uh, cleavage furrow and the cells pinch off, the nuclear envelope is completely reformed and the cells divide. Okay, so know all these steps, all these subphases um, pretty well, guys, because it becomes important in the regulation, especially when we're looking at the metaphase to anaphase transition. Um, now, you guys know that I love yeast and it's been such a great model for studying cell biology and, um, and probably the cell cycle is where we've gained just a ton of information because yeast, as you'll see in a second, um, has some really cool genetics behind it that allowed scientists to pick apart the cell cycle. Okay, so um, there's a couple of different forms of yeast who are shown here. There's Schizosaccharomyces pombi, which is considered fission yeast, and Saccharomyces cerevisiae, um, which is budding yeast. Okay, and so here you can see sort of their cell cycles um, as they're sort of laid out, G1, S, G2, um, and M. And the big difference between fission yeast um, and budding yeast is that the fission yeast actually divides more like a cell, whereas the budding yeast actually forms a little daughter bud off the, off the mother cell. Okay, um, and so in this instance it becomes a little more um, fuzzy in that, well, there's a clearly a G1 and there's an S phase, but then the G2 is sort of um, mixed in with, with M phase because the bud is starting to form um, and then uh, you have basically the uh, DNA segregation and then eventually the daughter bud will, will pinch off. Okay, so there's, uh, it's very difficult to sort of view any kind of G2 phase in uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, now, one of the things that I think you guys need to know is, unlike a mammalian cell, um, the, sac the nuclear envelope of Saccharomyces cerevisiae and Schizosaccharomyces pombi does, actu does not actually break down. Okay, so all of the mitosis and, and cell division is happening um, with the nuclear envelope intact. Um, now, what makes... Um, oh, and one last thing. Um, what's great about this is that the, the cell cycle control is actually really highly conserved from yeast to mammals. And so all of the information um, that's been gained from working with yeast um, really has been completely applicable to um, how cells divide in a mammalian, uh, or how mammalian cells divide. Okay, so one of the things that made uh, yeast such a great model for understanding the cell cycle is basically the adoption of what are called temperature sensitive alleles. Okay, um, now as you guys all know, the cell cycle is essential for viability. If you can't grow and divide, um, cells just they don't grow. They eventually just die. Okay, so um, it's an essential process for cells, and so. In order to do any sort of genetic screen for this, um, scientists had to come up with a very clever way in which to um, sort of study it. And so what they used were ten temperature sensitive alleles. Now, what basically a temperature sensitive allele is, it's a point mutation or some other um, genetic lesion that basically renders a protein partially functional. Okay, and so it functions at a low temperature. Um, however, at a high temperature, that protein becomes non-functional. So you have this sort of conditional allele where it's functional at a low temperature, but not functional at a high temperature, right? And this allows you to study um, 
basically essential processes. And this has been one of the really great tools that have been used by the, the yeast community to understand essential processes, right? They can grow their cells um, fine at low temperatures, um, but then when they basically put it to a high temperature, the cell basically arrests and dies at whatever phase that protein is needed at. Okay, and you can sort of see this here. Okay, at low temperature, the cell will basically go through G1, S, G2, and then M phase and divide. However, if you have a TS allele um, that's basically needed for the G1 to S transition and you shift it to a restricted temperature, when that protein is needed at that specific step, all the cells will stop growing at that step. Okay, and so this, um, so they did this with yeast using, um, and they called the mutants the CDC mutants, um, and all of the CDC TS alleles blocked progression of the cell cycle at various stages. Okay, and these tended to be checkpoint stages. So there's a checkpoint between G1 and S, um, and then there's a couple checkpoints um, later on in the cycle, um, and they could basically block um, uh, yeast. Um, at the different stages. And here's a perfect example of that. So there's CDC15 um, TS allele, uh, which actually blocks uh, cytokinesis. Okay, so here is the CDC15 uh, TS allele growing at its permissive temperature. This is the lower temperature, which allows it to grow. And you can see it's growing and it's budding, um, and the buds are sort of forming, and everything's perfect. The second you um, or close to perfect. Um, the second you move it to its restrictive temperature, the temperature at which the CDC mutant no longer works, the cells all sort of stall at the same uh, spot and they're basically blocked in cytokinesis. Okay, and so these cells can't finally pinch off. And so you get a uniform arrest at a specific time in the cell cycle. And so just by looking at this, you can tell that the CDC15 gene is needed to finish um, cytokinesis. Now, another great tool um, is the Xenopus egg, okay? Um, and what's great about this is it's a large um, frog eggs, and frogs actually lay a lot of eggs, and so you can make um, uh, cellular extracts from this and then basically use an in vitro system to study the cell cycle. Okay, so this is just a nice image of a frog egg. Um, and so basically the life cycle of a frog egg is simple. It starts off as a small oocyte and then it grows for months without dividing till it's a really large size egg. Um, and then basically the egg gets fertilized by a sperm and then the cell undergoes division without actually growing. Okay, and then it eventually uh, sort of develops into a tadpole and the tadpole develops um, into a frog. Okay, and what's sort of cool about this is approximately every 30 minutes the, um, the cells undergo division. Okay, so it's a great system to sort of study mitosis. Um, and as I said, they can actually uh, sort of collect a whole bunch of eggs and create a cell-free extract. And so you can get the cytoplasm um, from frog eggs, throw in some ATP and then nuclei um, from frog sperm, mix it into a little test tube, and let it just sort of free run, and the cell-free mitotic extract will actually undergo um, division and replication uh, over and over about every um, 40 to 60 minutes. Okay, so it's, it's easy to reconstitute the cell cycle in vitro in these Xenopus extracts, um, and that's been a huge tool because you can do things like add certain antibody inhibitors uh, to certain proteins, some of which were found in the yeast genetically first, and then they could sort of really tease apart exactly what they were doing. Um, another great system is just plain old mammalian cells, and so here's a nice little scanning EEM um, of fibroblasts, uh, and you know these are actively dividing um, in cell culture out in the lab. Okay, um, and one of the things that you have to know about um, cell culture is that most immortalized cell lines um, basically have undergone some sort of genetic transition, okay? Because normally a typical cell is under gonna, gonna undergo replicative senescence, okay? This is where it can no longer replicate its genome and it's believed that the telomeres have gotten too short in order for it to replicate and they eventually then, you know, uh, 
have a translocation event and the cells can't grow, okay? That's just a general um, thing that happens, okay? So you need to actually establish an immortalized cell line to do this, but if you do, it's pretty easy to study the cell cycle in these um, in cells, and people have been doing it for years. And, um, and another system you can basically use is uh, just following cell division by labeling um, the DNA. You can use this label called BRE, uh, BRDU, um, it's a thymidine analog, so it will, if you add it to um, cells, it'll actually uh, get incorporated during S phase, and then the, the cells will actually glow um, a, sort of a greenish yellow color um, because that's the color of the uh, bromodioxyuridine. Okay, so it's a thymidine analog. Um, and you can use that to then sort of do flow cytometry. Um, some of you guys may have heard of flow cytometry. Its official name is fax cell sorting, um, where it's basically fluorescence-associated cell sorting. And this can sort of sort um, cells based on a fluorescent character. So if you label DNA, it can actually measure DNA present in a cell. Okay, so these cells are in G1. They have basically one copy of the genome, and so it'll glow at a certain um, or a certain amount of fluorescence will be detected and those cells can get um, sorted. But then if the cells undergo S phase um, and uh, are in G2, uh, they'll have twice as much DNA, okay? And this also includes M phase um, up until the point where, you know, the end of cytokinesis happens, okay? So you'll have twice the amount of DNA and then the part in the middle are basically cells undergoing S phase. Um, so this is a, sort of a typical profile of sac, fac cell sorting when you're, when you're sort of studying the cell cycle. Okay, so how's the cell cycle regulated? Well, there's actually some very important control points, okay? And so there's a control point sort of at the end of G1 before it enters S phase, okay? Um, and that sort of can be considered the start checkpoint. And basically what the cell is asking, is the environment favorable? Is there enough nutrients around for me to replicate all of my DNA to completion and to undergo um, mitosis after that happens? Okay, and if the answer is yes, then it moves through um, S phase, okay? And the, the DNA is replicated. Then there's another gap phase, G2, where you know it's building up all of the nutrients it needs to go through mitosis. And then there's basically another um, checkpoint, the G2 to M checkpoint, and basically the cell is going to ask some specific questions. Okay, is the environment favorable to divide and support the growth of two individual cells? And the other one is, has all of the DNA been replicated without any uh, major damage? Okay, and that's an important point right here because you don't want to start dividing a cell if there's not a complete copy a complete good copy of um, the DNA. And we covered DNA repair, so you guys can sort of think of the mechanisms that would be involved um, in this to sort of look at it. Okay, and if the answer is yes here, um, then it will enter mitosis. Um, and then there's a final checkpoint, the metaphase to anaphase transition. And this is basically asking whether or not all of the sister chromatids are aligned along the metaphase plate. And if the answer is yes, and the cell believes that it can equally divide its, uh, you know, chromosomes among two cells, it will trigger, um, it will basically proceed through to anaphase, okay? Um, and then proceed to uh, cytokinesis, and then you'll have two cells, and then they'll grow through G1 again. Okay, so what is controlling all of these different checkpoints? Um, they're controlled by these proteins called cyclin and CDKs. Okay, um, and the cyclins actually associate with the CDKs, and the CDKs are cyclin-dependent kinases. So these uh, have kinase activity, but they won't actually exhibit any kinase activity unless there's the appropriate cyclin um, associated with it. Okay, and sometimes these actually have to get um, post-translationally modified in order to be active, and we'll take a look at that. Um, in a second. But these molecules actually signal to various aspects of the cell so that the cell can progress through the cell cycle. Okay, and depending on the checkpoint, different uh, cyclins are involved. Okay, and so you basic, during uh, uh, G1, you actually have the G1S cyclin. 
Um, and so this is uh, up high, and then this will actually signal to start making the S cyclin, um, and then the G1 cyclin is removed at the um, first checkpoint, and the S cyclin, SCDK, uh, takes over, okay? And that uh, actually remains around basically until the G2 to M checkpoint, um, at which point the M cyclin um, is now elevated and the M cyclin CDK will then take over. Okay, and then the final checkpoint is controlled by this um, APCC complex, which we'll um, learn about uh, in just a little bit. Okay, and so these are the checkpoints, and you can see how the different um, uh, S cyclins oscillate and um, throughout the cell cycle. Okay, um, here's some of the major. Um, cyclins in the cell, uh, so the cyclin CDK complex, so there's a G1 CDK, there's a G1 S CDK, an S cyclin CDK, and then an M cyclin CDK. And here are the cyclins that are involved and the CDK partners. Um, you guys don't really have to know um, the exact gene names for all of these, but you should know that there's these different um, cyclin CDK molecules. Okay, so it's fine if you just call them the G1 SCDK, the SCDK, and the MCDK. Um, um, okay, so the way the cyclin CDKs work is there's an activation step. Okay, so the first thing that you have is your inactive CDK, um, and it's actually got an ATP bound to it, um, and then a specific cyclin will come in um, and associate with it, and this makes it actually partially active. Okay, um, and then once you have this sort of partially active, you'll have what's called a, a CDK activating kinase or CAC, and the CAC will actually phosphorylate um, the CDK in what's called a T loop, um, and that basically results in an activating phosphorylation, and then the cyclin CDK, CDK becomes. Um, completely functional. Okay, so the CAC is going to actually make the cyclin CDK fully functional. Um, there's also inhibitory um, phosphorylation events, and one of that's controlled by WE1. Okay, so WE1 is a kinase, um, and it will actually phosphorylate a CDK and put on an inhibitory phosphate. So even though you have the activating phosphate, uh, the second WE1 puts on the additional phosphate, um, it becomes sort of inactive. And then there's a phosphatase called CDC25, which actually removes um, the inhibitory phosphate. Um, little point of interest, WE1 actually got its name because um, it was found in yeast and it actually uh, has sort of uncontrolled um, cell division and the colonies just become um, completely minute. Uh, Re they become really, really small, so they're wee in comparison to, uh, they're of wee size comparison to um, what a normal yeast colony would look like. Okay, so the wee one kinase puts an inhibitory phosphate on, and CDC 25 phosphatase can actually remove that inhibitory phosphate. Um, another way the cyclin CDKs are controlled um, are CDK inhibitor proteins, or CKIs. Okay, so here you'll have your active cyclin CDK. And then you'll have your CKI protein. In this case, the, um, the image shows this protein called P27, which will bind to the cyclin CDK and keep them inactive. Um, P21 and P16 are other CKIs. Um, and interestingly, um, oftentimes these CKIs are mutated in various cancers. So um, as I mentioned sort of on the introductory slide, you know, uh, uncontrolled cell cycle control is um, a hallmark of cancer, and one of the things is you don't have, you can oftentimes get a mutation in these CKI proteins, which leave them non-functional, and thus you just continue to progress through the cell cycle with, um, without any inhibition. And we'll see a little bit how that works um, in part two when we're looking at, you know, some of the checkpoints with DNA damage. Um, um, Okay, so another important th uh, thing in the cell cycle is proteolysis. Okay, so oftentimes we saw how the cyclin CDKs um, sort of um, oscillate, and they're actually um, 
removed in regulated proteolysis events. Okay, so here you have um, your M cyclin CDK, which is actually needed uh, to be removed for the metaphase to anaphase transition. And the way that happens is you have an activating subunit CDC20, which can bind to an inactive APCC complex. And the second that becomes active, it turns on the ubiquitylation machinery. And so you, your E1 and E2 uh, ubiquitin enzymes uh, actually will then start to add a polyubiquitin chain to the M-cyclin CDK, and it's actually degraded by the proteasome. Okay, so the anaphase promoting complex, when it becomes activated at the metaphase to anaphase transition, um, will actually clear the M cyclin. So if you go back uh, to this slide right here, you have basically the APCC um, removing the M cyclin. Um, and that's how that happens. Okay, and you can also have proteolysis of the CKIs, right? These are the inhibitor proteins that are bound to the cyclin CDKs. And when you want the cell to progress through the cell cycle, one of the things you do is you can remove the CKIs. And the way that works is um, pretty simple. You'll have your CDK inhibitor protein. Typically, it's bound to a cyclin CDK inhibiting things, and then it will actually get phosphorylated. That post-translational modification is then recognized by an F box protein, and then the SCF complex will come in and help to recruit the E1 and E2 um, ubiquitylation enzymes and you'll get a polyubiquitin tail and then this will be degraded by the proteasome and thus alleviating any kind of inhibition. Um, the SCF complex uh, here is actually an, a, an, a, an acronym for the skip colon F box um, and I encourage you guys to all look back um, at proteolysis um, when we covered it in post uh, transcriptional regulation of proteins. Um, I haven't quizzed you on it yet, but um, you know now we're starting to see where that's important, um, and I really want you guys to sort of tie that in together um, with uh, sort of regulated events like this um, and with the previous slide here, okay? There's, there would also be a skip colon complex um, that probably would help in this process as well. Um, okay. Uh, now here's just some of the major cell cycle, cell cycle regulating enzymes. Um, some of the ones that you'll need to know, um, which we've already covered, are CACs, uh, WE1, and CDC25. Um, and then there's your CKIs. You don't have to memorize all of the CKIs, um, but it's important to know what the CKIs do. Um, and like I said, a lot of times uh, these are frequently inactivated um, in, in cancer, and it says it right here for P16. But there's also examples of P21 and, and uh, P27. Um, and then some other um, enzymes that are needed, the APCC um, and, you know, and the skip colon and things that are needed to basically uh, lead to proteolysis and removal of, um, of the different uh, cell cycle regulators. Um, okay, so just to dive back into cell cycle control um, and exactly how it's sort of monitored and some of the things that it's looking at. So, you know, if, if the environment is favorable, you'll get a signal to the G1 CDK, which will then lead to um, the G1 S cyclin synthesis. Um, and then if it turns out that there's DNA damage, the DNA damage will actually inhibit the G1 SCDK as well as the SCDK, right? If there's DNA damage, you do not want to enter S phase and replicate your DNA. You want to fix it before you replicate it. Um, okay, and then when you get to sort of the start of mitosis um, at the um, G2 to M transition, uh, basically, the cell is going to ask some other questions like, is all the DNA replicated and is there DNA damage? If either of these come back and say, um, you know, is true, it's going to block um, the MCDK from going forward, and that's going to then further inhibit uh, any DNA re-replication re um, to make sure that, you know, it's not re-replicating its DNA. And if the answer is, you know, um, that there's no DNA damage and all of the DNA has been replicated and the environment is favorable, it'll go on through M phase um, and then it'll check to see whether or not the uh, sister chromatids are attached, have bipolar attachment to the spindle. Um, if they don't, it's going to block APCs. Um, C from uh, initiating uh, anaphase. 
Okay, if all if there's good attachment to everything, it will stimulate um, attachment. Um, okay, so let's look at the replication control um, in specifically, and and we've already sort of covered this when we covered DNA replication, um, but we'll we'll just cover it again here. Okay, so normally you have your pre-replicative complexes um, in G1, and then once they're sort of uh, made, the decision has been made to go through. Um, the synthesis phase, the SCDK becomes activated and you get formation of the pre-initiation complex and your replication forks and then replication proceeds. Okay, and then once replication has proceeded and all is good and you're basically at the, um, you know, uh, the transition from G2 to M, uh, what's going to end up happening is you'll get M cyclin CDK activation which will then um, you know, further uh, lead to chromosome segregation and APCC activation, um, and then basically all the CDKs become inactive and the cell is back into G1 again, okay? Um, so these are just some of the uh, controls. If we want to look at, you know, um, the replication one a little closer, and we've seen this before, you have in G1 your origin recognition complex bind to binding to the origin, and then CDC6 and CDT1 uh, sort of come in in G1, and that helps to recruit the um, MCM helicase, uh, and then you have your pre-replicative complex, okay? And then when it comes time to pass from G1 to S phase, the SCDK basically triggers S phase, and the way that it does this um, is it phosphorylates CDC um, six, and that's pr uh, presumably recognized by a skip colon F box protein and then degraded um, by the proteasome once it gets its polyubiquitin attachments to it. Okay, um, and that then brings in the, the pre initiation complex, um, and you'll get phosphorylation um, of uh, the ORC protein, um, and then uh, the replication fork will form, and then you get the replication of DNA. And we've already covered uh, DNA replication, so we won't do that. And then when you enter G1 or G2 to M, the origin of replication complex is just phosphorylated, and that's an indication that the DNA has sort of been replicated. Okay. Um, after the DNA has been replicated, you need to actually hold the sister chromatids together. Okay, and this is done by cohesin. Okay, so here you have um, basically the cohesin complex. You have the SMC uh, molecule, which has a coiled coil domain and a hinge region, so SMC1 and SMC3. And then there's a couple other proteins, the SSC1 and SSC3, that uh, sort of hold it together here. Okay, and these sort of create a little loop that holds the sister chromatids together. Um, you guys don't need to necessarily know all of the exact names of the proteins in the cohesin complex, but know that cohesin actually holds the sister chromatids together. And, and we'll see why that's important um, in sort of the next part of uh, today's lecture. Um, now, the mitosis itself is actually controlled by the MCDK. Um, uh, and the M cyclin CDK. Okay, and so here you have the M cyclin CDK. When they come together, it's largely inactive. Um, you'll have your CAC, your CDK activating kinase, which adds the activating phosphate on it. And then you also, what happens is it'll initially um, get an inhibitory phosphate um, added to it and it becomes inactive. Okay. Um, then all of a sudden what you'll get is a signal and the C, uh, CDC25 gets phosphorylated um, and it becomes basically um, active and removes the inhibitory phosphate. And then you have some positive feedback where you basically um, sort of phosphorylate CDC25 to remove more of the inhibitory phosphate on the M cyclin CDK and also the M active M cyclin CDK is going to basically work in a negative fashion to inhibit an inhibitory kinase which makes it positive feedback. Okay, so this is negatively affecting an inhibitory kinase, so that turns out to be positive. So in other words, all of the newly synthesized inactive M 
the cyclin CDK will just be phosphorylated by the CAC, which only puts on the activating phosphate, okay, to make it fully active. Okay, and so here's just an example of how the cell cycle, once it makes a determination, um, sort of immediately goes from an inactive state to an active state. Um, so once the chromosomes are condensed, um, you know, the, you have to basically attach them to uh, sort of the, the centromere on the chromosome. You'll have to have bipolar attachment. Um, but uh, chromosome condensation actually happens um, during, uh, during M phase, okay? And if there's a defect in this chromosome condensation, it actually leads to um, cell cycle arrest. And the protein that's involved in condensing the chromosomes is this complex called condensin, which don't confuse it with cohesin, which actually is holding these sister chromatids together. The condensin actually condenses the chromosome. Okay, and, and condensation is actually needed to proceed through the cell cycle. Um, now, condensin actually uh, resembles cohesin quite a bit. Um, you have SMC uh, molecules, two and four, um, and you know you can see here that they have coiled coiled domains there's an ATPase domain um, and then you have the cap uh, H and G and D2 proteins associated with it and this um, condenses uh, the sister chromatids okay and it's structurally related to cohesin but um, they do different things um, okay so that's um, all I have for uh, part A in part B we're going to look at some of the actual structural components uh, and all of the you know various mechanisms um, and how the cyclin CDKs uh, actually can control those things and all the other important parts about the cell cycle um, so I will be back uh, in just a second